you know, something just popped up on the screen here. It says this meeting is being recorded. Uh, okay. Um, all right. Uh, some of the sub app is copyrighted. That so should be fine. Okay. I think this is the look I get sometimes when I start talking about some of this stuff. So hopefully, when I explain some definitions to you, it will, uh, it'll become a bit more clear. So the goals of this um, talk are basically to give you an understanding of the different types of extended reality um, options that are out there, and that's often referred to as XR. That's augmented reality, virtual reality, and mixed reality. I want to talk a little bit about some of the uses that have been happening currently and some of the trajectory where I think mixed reality and extended reality options are going in orthopedic surgery. And then to understand how mixed reality may offer some value to shoulder uh, shoulder classifications, in particular at this time. <laughs> I'm not going to cover in depth a lot of the virtual reality options. There are tons of them. We will kind of touch on them, but there are so many different things out there that sort of bog down the talk. And I'm not going to go into a lot of depth about again robotic navigation systems that are currently on the market. So. Okay, so this is an example um, of something I'm not going to tell you what it is yet in terms of like what exactly type, what type of uh, option this is in terms of augmented reality, mixed reality, or virtual reality. We'll kind of go over that in a minute. But this is um, in my basement, uh, me doing a study that we'll talk about soon. But essentially, you can see that there's a uh, object that I'm manipulating there that should be a guide uh, for a V2 plan like. All right, so what is that? Well, extended reality or XR covers everything, right? So we're talking about augmented reality, virtual reality, and mixed reality. Um, if you're thinking about augmented reality, it's like an overlay of computer-generated content in the real world, but you only interact with it superficially. So think about like Pokemon Go was like this very, very popular game. That's the kind of thing where in popular culture you might think about when you're thinking about something simple like augmented reality. Virtual reality is... Um, you know, it encompasses all these immersive experiences. So if you are in a fully immersive environment, whether that is computer generated content or whether that's sort of, um, you know, real world content from video, as long as it's like a 360 degree sort of entirely generated experience uh, or rather immersive experience, that is virtual reality. And then mixed reality is an overlay of synthetic content where you can actually manipulate some of the, uh, the objects in, in real time in the real world. So um, mixed reality experiences often will, will show things like occlusion, where you might put an object down and it's actually, it actually seems like you can't see it. It kind of picks up some of the other things in the environment. So you can actually interact with the environment. And that's an example of one of my residents um, you know, looking at a head at a, a, a shoulder off plastic case we're going to be doing. So in particular, my kind of expertise is in the Microsoft HoloLens 2, which was released in 2019. Um, it's a big improvement over the Microsoft HoloLens 1 and a couple of different things ability to uh, optically track certain things has a wider um, field of view. And big companies uh, like Airbus were buying up in, in large quantities. So it's very hard to get for a period of time. And just, I think, in terms of you know, not being a business purchase, you could get it in June of 2020, or July of 2020. Um, so this is the one we're going to focus on most. But there are actually a lot of different devices like this on the market. And I think ultimately figuring out who's going to have the biggest market share is kind of one of those like you know, beta mass versus VHS Things we'll figure out in the next five years or so, but um, this one seems to be um, pretty popular this far. So how did I get here? Um, for the people who kind of um, you know know it's I wasn't I'm not that far removed from, from being in your seat. Um, so I did as, as um, Dr. Gat mentioned a hand up for Shreve Fellowship of Hospital Joint Diseases, which uh, I think was quite good. And certainly can talk to uh, Dr. Coyle about that as well because uh, I think you guys will work with you guys work with Ryan Coyle, I imagine. Um, so I can tell you about it. I had a great experience there, but I always kind of knew that I wanted to do more full upper extremity work, and I felt that I wanted to really get some expertise from Dr. Walsh in, in France. That was also a gold mine, and uh, Dr. Monica kind of heard me do that. So I had sort of planned ahead to do that. Um, very rewarding experience. So um, uh, Lyon, France, is kind of uh, near the near the Alps, um, second biggest city, depending on how you break things down, and it's a beautiful place to, to train. Um, this is kind of what, what it looks like from the old old city. But if you just go there for visiting, it's awesome. But it's a really fantastic place to train. And uh, I, I highly encourage it. 
Um, but then I, I went to uh, New Zealand, which is also just an incredible place to live. They have a really interesting medical system there where you they have private insurance and uh, you know universal health coverage, but um, you cannot be sued as a doctor. So um, their training is uh, very interesting. And uh, I wouldn't say they care about the list quite as much, uh, but the, the rest of it is a really excellent training. It takes a bit longer, um, but I was uh, very pleased to train there and you can be paid quite well as a fellow. You can do other trauma lists. So when you get busy, when you get good enough, they'll just say like, do you want to run your own room today? If you want to do so, it's a really nice way to set up practice. So um, I think that um, that's a uh, fantastic place to train as well. And that's the more short hospital where I was at. So um, Jill Walsh is my, um, you know, he, unfortunately, well, for, this comes for everybody, but he just sort of retired from uh, active surgical practice like a month ago. Um, he uh, is sort of the, one of the biggest names in shoulder surgery and is the best finesse surgeon I've ever worked with. But he was very instrumental in this thing you'll see on the bottom of the screen there called Blueprint. It was a, a, a program called Glenistus that he had sort of uh, helped design and own that company and then, you know, sold it to, now, now it's rolled out in several iterations, still by Stryker at this point, but as far as um, three-dimensional preoperative planning goes, this is my first time seeing that, and it was really helpful. He uses PSI, or patient-specific instrumentation, which in this case is a 3D printed guide for everybody, right? That's not the way everybody usually does it. His practice is kind of unique, but um, it was very helpful for me to understand more about what we were doing, and I got really interested in sort of how are we modeling these things, and that sort of sparked my interest in, in going further with this type of that's for those of you who aren't familiar with it, that's just an example of how you can do a preoperative plan to, to guide exactly where you put wire, which is where you, you base a lot of the, the difficult work of shoulder arthroplasty um, uh, comes from reaming and making a good decision where that guy wire goes. So then I ended up in Auckland and Peter Poon, it's a designer for uh, EMA prosthesis, which is what I use primarily. Uh, there's some things I really liked about that. And some of it's just familiarity. Start to use it more. It's more and more hands on. The model for a fellowship in Europe is more observational. You're in surgeries and you're, you're learning a ton, but you're not doing as much. In New Zealand, where again, the medical legal aspect of it probably plays a role as well, um, you are super hands on. So that was great. I learned some other techniques from him in terms of using fluoroscopy to um, help uh, with, with cases and really help your accuracy um, as well. So he plans with Cassia, but does not use a lot of patient specific instrumentation. So it's nice to kind of see both. So I really like the preoperative planning aspect. It wasn't offered with the prosthesis that I liked. So I thought to myself, how can I sort of bridge that gap and get better at what I like to do, but still use the implants that I want to use? Um, this got me to sort of a 3D printing hobby. If you've never seen the 3D printer, that's the you know, sort of very low cost one that I have in my home on the right. And uh, that's a picture from the Rhino CAD software that I learned to use. But Bruno Gavato is a guy you can find uh, online. He is from Brazil. He's sort of like, the experts in the world in terms of taking and teaching uh, CAD software for orthopedists and uh, 3D printing for orthopedics. Again, in the southern part of Brazil, he has very few rules about what he's allowed to do. So he will make his own 3D printed guides for anybody he wants and will sterilize them for screen VR. Um, I, I've looked into that. My hospital does not allow it, but, uh, <laughs> um, but it's, you know, it's, it's interesting just to see what, you, what you're capable of. And there's some pros and cons to that as well. But, um, he introduced me to Thomas Gregory, who has been very helpful to me. Thomas was uh, someone we'll talk about soon. He's one of the first uh, people to do a holographic surgical assisted surgery for shoulder arthroplasty. Um, I started making some apps and using augmented reality. You can see a picture in the bottom of the screen. That's an app that I made that can um, you know, pick up the model of a, of a, basically of a scapula, not the entire scapula. As you see, it's kind of cut off there, but for planning, um, which is really cool. That kind of caught his interest and he invited me to take part in some Microsoft 24 hour surgical event. And that's kind of how I started transitioning apps and making them for the, the HoloLens and using them with it. So, how can you use extended reality in orthopedics? And it's just a it's massive area. We're barely scratching the surface of at this point, right? So, this is a really good paper. And I think one of the areas where there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of work so far is in is by surgery. So, you'll find that. Um, I think just because you have both neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons doing a lot of this work and a lot of navigation techniques have started there. Um, there's a lot of people who are investigating this in that area. So um, this is from the Journal of Orthopedic Surgery 2020. Um, they've got a, a couple, you know, just an interesting review as well. So this is a, a topic you're interested in. I would, I would encourage you to find this paper. This is a picture that's from it. We'll talk about some of these things in particular. One, it kind of shows, again, some of the things we talked about before. So virtual reality, complete immersion, that's the person on the top left. And also in the bottom left, you can see the uh, kind of silly look of the education, but uh, that's kind of what you look like when you wear these things. It is a bit silly looking from the outside, but uh, you learn quite a bit. 
Um, also, so you got simulation training, right? So you got your navigation, things up at the top, right? You got surgical guidance and execution, different conferences, informed consent. We're going to talk more in depth, but this, this sort of is one, one, I think, very nice breakdown of all the different things you can do. So this is some pictures of, of um, still shots from the, the app that, uh, that I've made and um, just using it for primarily shoulder arthroplasty in this particular setting. So I've got a, uh, on the top left, a glenosphere there with a uh, wedge that I'm gonna make for a bone graft. Uh, it's a nice way to kind of see, hey, exactly where is this seated? You can play with the transparency, different things. So it's very helpful. But I think because the market, and how this stuff is really developed in general, unless you are developing yourself, implant companies, obviously have a vested interest in you. They want to sell you implants. So their apps, their machines, their programs are tailored very to very specific interests. But on the whole, extended reality options are a tool that you can use for lots of things. So um, if you know how to use the tool, then it doesn't really matter that it's not for shoulder arthroplasty. I use it for a difficult non-union case where if you, if you understand how to segment a diacom image and build something three-dimensional from that, you can then use that for difficult fracture planning. You can use it for all kinds of things. So um, I found that uh, this is not something that anyone's going to approach you with because I don't think there's a particular financial market for it. But if you want to plan difficult cases for anything, difficult osteotomies, challenging anatomies, tumor surgery, I can see how this can be used for many, many things. This is just one example of you know, how I was in my basement looking at how, how telescope that part of the proximal fragment was on the distal fragment, and it certainly was, uh, was helpful for me. So we'll go into you know, a bit more of that in detail. But yeah, I was able to bring that to the OR and uh, and you know, ultimately, look, you're gonna make these decisions based on your, your skill set. Do you need this? No, I think it's still helpful in preoperative planning primarily, but it is nice to be able to actually make that comparison and do it in a sterile way that really has no significant risk to the patient. Um, so one of the other things I think is great is you can do preoperative planning across the globe. You can collaborate with colleagues. This is um, myself with uh, France and Switzerland in my basement. Um, Looking at a you know difficult distal humeral case there, <laughs> probably a bit loud in the volume there. I apologize, but um, but yeah, so it's been very cool um, for sort of um, technology dorks like myself to you know uh, collaborate with people from different countries about tough cases, and you can actually share these models and pass them across the table to each other. It's it's pretty fascinating. So I think that's one area that's still very early in the process, and some of those programs are a bit kind of clunky still, but um, very, very promising in terms of, you know, conferences and all kinds of things that you can do with people that it opens up sort of like a realm of expertise and you wouldn't have access to before, but you can really show something you're thinking about. So there's lots of different papers out there. I thought this one was pretty nice. It's relatively new, but basically, you know, it looks at how virtual reality training improves performance. I'm about to make sort of air quotes up there for people who can't see me, but um, virtual reality training has been very, um, I think well proven at this point to train people to do specific tasks. So if you look at training people that don't know about anterior hip surgery and you get two different groups and you control for you know, their level of experience and then you have independent surgeons watch them and say, you know, how far along in the process are they able to get? Their performance is better in one area. Obviously it's not helping their, their, their overall knowledge per se. So there's probably some, some gaps in what it can offer you. But for uh, specifically for training to do certain procedures, it does seem to be uh, an effective way to do things. There are a ton of different companies out there exploring this right now. There's a lot of uh, capital being directed to it. So it's, it's pretty, pretty fascinating. But again, um, there's a difference here between virtual reality and mixed reality. I, I'm more of a mixed reality options that I think gives you more options of what you can do because you can interact with the world itself. None of them have great haptic feedback where you're actually feeling what you're doing just yet. Virtual reality is doing more of the work on that. And there are some, some devices that can use some haptic feedback regarding, you know, am I grabbing this with my hands to like there's gloves or there's like a, you, you won't see if you're actually just holding a pen, but it sort of seems more real because you're it will look like you're holding a you know, tibial nail or something like that. So um, I think that there's a, a lot of work still to be done, but um, this seems to be the, the main area where virtual reality uh, seems to be taking off in, in terms of uh, surgical training. And this is what you look like, unfortunately, but uh, that's just kind of how it goes. So one thing I, I have not done this, this is impressive to me. This is my colleague, Dr. Mohi Taha from Switzerland. Um, he started to use it very quickly and, and he doesn't have the same sort of app development experience, but he was still an early adopter of this technology. And one of the things he's doing, he's 
just left sort of a bigger university practice and was um, uh, developing you know, his own private practice. And he's finding that there's a wow factor this where patients really like it. And he can really show them this model on the screen. If you look on the right side of this picture, you'll see that the screen that he's seeing is actually projected onto that computer. And so he can show patients in a way that he really couldn't before. This is, you know, this is exactly what we're going to do. And a lot of patients respond positively to that. So are they really understanding it more? When you train for X number of years, there's only so much of your expertise you can really tell somebody. Yeah. Can you tell everyone every single risk and benefit of every surgery you go through? No, you're not going to be able to do that. But I think it's one way to connect with people uh, better so they have a more clear understanding visually of what you will be offering them and how you'll be changing their anatomy. So um, the first holographic shoulder arthroplasty, at least that I can find, was performed by my, my colleague, um, uh, Dr. Thomas Gregory, who I sort of mentioned before. And this is in 2017. He was using a HoloLens one. I wouldn't call this navigation. This is what we used to call holographic surgery, in that you can guide in this model wherever you want. So he's got a, a guide of the patient's anatomy at that time. He sort of like guided in holographically, just directly over the patient's anatomy. I actually don't enjoy doing it that way. I don't think that's at least the way that the visualization is, that it's as so it's just sort of having a model in your mind. We can talk about why it's sort of as, as it's the end of the lecture. But um, this was one of the first times that was used for that reason. And um, since then, there's been a lot of things that have, I think, progressed from there. So there's been a whole event about that. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But um, if you think about how can you use this device, it's not exactly the mixed reality you want, but these head mounted devices in general. They can be used for tons of different things. So if you're recording, that, that's a picture of something that I was recording during surgery, you can project that to any screen, right? So yes, there's some technical challenges, I'm sure, but you can have that projected to the wall in your operating room so that perhaps know where you are in case if you're, if, you know, you have one person holding a hook on another side of the table, they might not know exactly where you are learning as much. They can see exactly what you're seeing. So I think from an educational standpoint, it's very good, but it's also nice to make sure that everybody knows where you are exactly. What's the next thing you need? It helps people stay sort of focused. So that's one, I think, good thing about it. You can kind of see how in the bottom right how they can answer, but you can use this anywhere. So I, I assisted someone with a surgery in, in Brazil. I mean, he didn't really need my help, honestly, but it was more like, you know, sort of playing around with these, these different surgeons. But with a 24 hour live event, and you could help people from anywhere in the world, you can use Microsoft Teams. They can project this stuff to you, and you can basically, you know, see or help them during surgery. At this stage of the game, these people are kind of experts. In, it was more just kind of, I think, just showing what the technology could do rather than them really needing assistance. But you can kind of see how this would be a way to expand expertise to parts of the world or uh, areas where people you know, might run into trouble. Depending on um, where you train and what the medical legal sort of system is as well, um, you could be checking on fellows in rooms, say, hey, what are you seeing? You have a problem. You know, yeah, that's good. I, I agree with that position, et cetera. So still some research to be done on, on, um, on that. I, I'm sort of going to be doing some, some work with some other surgeons about can we actively assist people with placement of pins, you know, from afar? Can we do that? Is it more accurate if you have a less experienced hand to have someone watch you do it? We don't know yet, but I'm, I'm hopeful to, uh, to help us that something in the future. Um, one of the things that's, I think, more simple is just augmented reality. So this is a, a form of navigation that's, you know, used in spine, you know, uh, not all the time, obviously, but it's not, uh, not a surprise you know, that this can be done. I think one of the difficulties is always, am I looking away from the patient? You know, what am I doing with my hands while I'm looking at the screen somewhere else? And one of the simplest things you can do with a head mounted display is just take that screen you're already looking at and have it project in front of you in a way that's somewhat transparent. So you don't have to look away from the patient, which I think is a nice, um, relatively simple use of this technology, but, but nice. And it sort of doesn't make people um, have to learn an entirely new system from what they did before. They can use something similar, but, um, be more patient focused uh, and, and not to look away. Um, in terms of where are we headed, I think that navigation and mixed reality is probably where things are going. And there's been a lot of different work on that so far. It's still relatively early stage. I think that for now, it's more of a preoperative planning tool still. And I think that uh, while you can use it for intraoperative execution, and I think there's some We'll, we'll talk about some of the data I'm working on for that. Um, it's not truly navigation. You're not registering the patient's anatomy and then overlaying something directly on them. Or at least no, no computerized system is doing that for you. You are looking at it yourself and deciding where you're going to place your model, your pin, your wire, or what have you. 
But there are some, uh, some people that are working on that. Luc Favard's group in France has done some work. This is actually from 2018. And the idea is that um, a commercially available software that does something like this is called Euphoria. And basically what you're doing is you program a model into this software. And then you train it in sort of a database. And then when you look at it in whatever thing you're using in your app, whether it's a cell phone, whether that's your uh, HoloLens 2, it will recognize the edges of the mask sort of uh, thing you're looking at. It's still very difficult. And you can see even in this model, if you look very closely at the, uh, the top, you can't, they had to keep in the whole coracoid and part of the acromion because unfortunately, I've done a lot of work on this on my own. You, if you just have a, a face of glenoid, current stuff is just not good enough yet to pick it up to navigate it. So I think one day we'll get there, but in terms of actually registering exactly where you want to be with a very small piece of bone, we're just not quite there yet, unless you're using some of the technology that currently exists, which is registering in a different way, using a separate camera, but using it directly through your mixed reality head mounted display, we're not quite there yet. Um, this is pretty interesting. They have actually shown, this is from, uh, from the Balgris in Switzerland, but um, what they're, what they're doing with the HoloLens 1 is they're using this, this model and taking something like, they call it a fiduciary model, but essentially that's like a QR code right there. They're using this to actually register the anatomy. And then after that, they're using this to basically tell you, hey, in a more navigational way, hey, what do, how far off am I from the anatomy that I registered? This is the hardest part about any form of navigation. It's actually registering the anatomy accurately that's in front of you. And whether you're doing that with a, a bulky sort of camera that's somewhere else in the room. I mean, look, this has been done in, in knee surgery for a very long time. And while I, you know the evidence is, is not uh, largely in favor of it making a difference in knee surgery, we are dealing with a smaller piece of bone here. So I think that there's probably some upside to having more accuracy in this area. Uh, but current technology, um, I think it's a little bit clunky and I, I don't prefer that navigation technique uh, myself at this time. Uh, I'm excited to see where we, we go with it from a mixed reality standpoint though. Um, bad slide uh, from my standpoint, I don't question block the, uh, the actual paper, but this is just showing how, it's, how it can be used in spine surgery as well. One of the things that I, I didn't really think about until doing more research on how it could be used was that, um, and I'll be interested to you know, pick your brain math in a, in a little bit, but um, what is the, uh, when you, when you have a patient on the table, that may not actually match the patient's scan because you have more necrosis or, you know, the preoperative scan may not be as helpful as you think if you're trying to use it for navigation. So there's OR techniques and things people are doing intraoperatively to, 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 to gain this um, more accurate model of what we do on the table. Um, this is an example of how they used augmented reality to overlay uh, some data on, on top of that. I'm not exactly sure how helpful it would be for a certain of that particular use if you already have navigation other than the heads of the slide we kind of looked at before but um I'm, I'm you know i'd like to talk to some spine surgeons find out more about how they use it from an industry standpoint um there is a lot of uh money going to this and a lot of companies who are sort of staking their future on this type of work and so MedAct is one of them and they basically have a, a single next ar that they're using and essentially they're they're advertising this and i, I kind of agree with this this is one of their uh, piece of their um advertising material but Navigation towers are a little bit uh, bulky. They get in the way if you like wearing hoods or you have multiple people around the actual area you're trying to navigate. You can get in the way. Robotic arms are kind of bulky. They're you know somewhat challenging to set up in some cases. You may need to have a dedicated operator for that as well. So this you know the device of the Hololens too it takes away all of that. It's a simple head mount display. It's much much easier. In this case, what they're using is an infrared um, device. I don't. I have not actually seen this yet. I don't know about it, but it's more just to illustrate the fact that there are multiple different navigation aspects that are currently being investigated. And I think time will tell what is the most uh, popular, but um, a lot of companies are making pretty big bets on this. This actually comes from the New England uh, Baptist Hospital. And uh, one of uh, Jerry Preston's sort of mentors um, will use this form of image guidance. So he's got this large sort of QR code, which then projects an image of the pelvis below that. I think the reason he can do this is he uses this particular tool, which I was not familiar with. This, this guy has this metal tool you can see uh, on the pelvis sort of dictating exactly where different parts are. So it's sort of easier to use this, uh, this image guided thing where you look at that QR code. That is something that is well, very well done by technology, meaning augmented reality, 
mixed reality options when picking up a QR code like that can project an image very, very accurately. But overall, looking at like the edges of a, of a screen or some other model that's not very specific, they're not as good at. So this is a really nice way to do it, but I think it, it kind of works because of the other tool that he has. So I'll be curious to see how this plays out in the future, but another, you know, just, just another example of how it's not just shoulder surgery, it's not just, you know, difficult tumor cases, or you can really use this tool for lots of different orthopedic cases. So what is the actual process? How do I, how do, I do this? How do I make this app for, uh, for the HoloLens? First, you have to take your DICOM images, right? So you get your CAT scan, right? Then a DICOM image. In the top right, that's, that's a picture of a, a slicing program, compiling program where this is called Invisalius, but um, 3D slicers are really commonly used. These are free, free softwares. And you will actually you know, generate a 3D image from your, from your CAT scan. I think it's a great skill for anyone to learn. It's not a very difficult thing to do. And you can play around with that. And I think that if you just did that alone, you'd still be gaining a big appreciation for what your CAT scan is to do. Um, then I put it into a CAD software. Uh, I think that you can get free ones. I spent, I think about 500 bucks on, uh, on sort of a, a good one, which I've, I've now learned over the past couple of years. So it's a, that's a reasonable investment to me, but uh, I found it very, very useful. And it's, you know, it's more powerful than even I, I know what to do with it. I'm sure there's some good free options of what you can do. Um, Blender seems to be one of the ones that people are using. And there's maybe a 50 or a hundred dollar add-on for that. That's pretty good. Um, Unity is the, is the actual, um, software that helps with, I think it's initially for game development, but you can use it for lots of things. And I started to learn how to use that. And once you start to import your uh, .obj files or whatever files you decide to use into that environment, then you can start to play around with them and you know, assign values to them, like, can I grab this with my hands? Or you know, what can I do with this particular thing? And then ultimately using it in interoperative execution. So. I'm gonna play a short video here of you know how I actually use kind of from start to finish, not exactly with the, the DICOM slicing part of it, but um, uh, music's not very good, but I made it to avoid copyright things, so. <laughs> If you just get to this point alone and you don't even go on to having a 3D model, I still think it's very helpful for what you're, you're planning to do. Because of some of the projection issues, I've started playing around with different colors of the models, but really holding these things in your hand, you don't, you don't really hold them in your hand, but being able to manipulate them and, and look at them from every angle and play with the size of them, I think is, is very, very useful for your preoperative plan. And this is where I think most of the value of this technique is still preoperative planning to really know before you go your implants, every single part of the surgery sort of played out in your head ahead of time. But there is a component of interoperative execution and checking things I think is helpful as well. And it seems to add, you know, no, you know, uh, no morbidity to the patient. So something you can wear on your head and, and do in a case without adding significant time or uh, problems with stability. So. So I'm able to use this uh, pin placement here. And one of the techniques I, I learned uh, actually from, uh, from Peter Poon um, in New Zealand is using more simple techniques of fluoroscopy. So I'm still using some of those things as well in the second level, but I think having this extra sort of check for the patients has been, uh, been very helpful. And this is just me putting in front of my computer screen at home, uh, which I'm sure is not a very accurate way of checking your results, but uh, still, still working on exactly how to compare that component of it, but uh, it's still just kind of cool to see if you set the size up. Um, does it seem like you've uh, met your operative plan? So. Okay, so how can we get value out of this particular device? What does that actually mean? So in a couple of years, it's been a number of years now, uh, but one of Dr. Monica's mentors, uh, J.P. Warner, came here, and he's very focused on this kind of stuff. Of what is what is value actually, right? And it, effectively, it's quality divided by cost. So um, I think there's a lot of stuff that goes into that. But um, currently, um, there are some some downsides. There's some good things about the technology that is currently available, and there's some downsides to it as well. So 3D printed patient-specific implants are are relatively inexpensive, but they probably cost between 
$500 and $1,500 to a hospital uh, or an ambulatory surgery center, uh, depending on the contracts you have with those companies. The HoloLens costs $3,500, and robots, depending on, you know, again, certain agreements can cost up to a million dollars, but I think that who, who pays and, you know, exactly what you have is hard to quantify exactly when you look over lots of different uh, hospital systems. Um, in terms of the 3D patient-specific implants, they work quite well. There's a lot of evidence in favor of them saying that they can be used to uh, improve accuracy. Although, interestingly enough, if you have very experienced surgeons who have done other forms of 3D planning, you'll find that that improvement goes down because they're quite accurate regardless of what they use. However, as, as patients get more deformity, as cases get a little harder, they tend to be a little more effective. Downsides are it takes several weeks to have it delivered to you. In most cases, if you drop it or there's a sterility problem, you have a big problem in your hands. Um, robotics and other forms of navigation have excellent evidence in terms of improving accuracy, but all of them have some issues, kind of like we showed before in that picture. They can at times not work. Sometimes they will have problems registering very difficult anatomy or crazy osteophytes that project out of different places. Um, you can kind of get in the way of it and then it, it won't navigate for you. So I think that um, while they have good evidence in favor of them, there are certainly some problems and they can be uh, costly for a hospital system to, to implement. So um, I decided to look into this a bit more and started a, a study. Uh, I'm actually going to be going to Poland to present this data at the uh, European Shoulder Elbow Conference soon. So I got accepted. I'm pretty happy about that. I'll have to get uh, some more info from Andre about the, uh, the details. But um, So um, basically, the, the setup of this, there's really not much assessment of the actual intraoperative viability of mixed reality. There are some companies now that are really uh, pushing it. Striker is one of them. Uh, so there are more surgeons starting to, to use this and, and advertise for it as well. The HoloLens 2 is about 3500 bucks, and I think can represent significant cost savings um, compared to a robot or even multiple cases of patient instrumentation. Um, if you could show that it's similarly accurate, then I think that the turnaround time for patients can be very fast. It's something you can plan on your own. Um, and even if it's not perfectly accurate, my thought was this is just one of the several aspects that this device can do. It's a tool that does many things. And so I still think it would be you know, highly valuable. So um, what we did was we made a 60 polyurethane um, sawbones model. So I used a 3D printer to make a mold and then we pour the polyurethane into the mold to get the appropriate um, bone foam that's you know, similar to what's been used in other papers. Um, I made this app, which I was going kind to of show you at the beginning to just have a 3D model of exactly the B2 model that I wanted and the, the planned guide pin placement. Um, I had four different residents and myself. We drilled different guide pins into this B2 planet model. And uh, I performed 20 and they each performed 10. Uh, we did this in a randomized order to prevent sort of a, a learning component. So, you know, if you just do all of your mixed reality at the end, you've already done seven other, other uh, attempts, you might be better on your last three. And I can look at that and say, oh, you know, mixed reality is great. But that's probably not an accurate way of looking at it. So there are a lot of things we did to make it as challenging as possible. Um, one of the things we also didn't control for was like, the inclination or any of the things like that. Well, the model, we wanted to move around a little bit so that um, it wasn't one standardized position that would sort of facilitate that effect of you know, learning and getting better. It was one, one shot, one pass at the wire, um, which is obviously not realistic. You, can, you have some chance to change that in real life. Um, but I wanted to you know, sort of make it as difficult as possible for the mixed reality device. And um, these models have been taken back to CAT scanner and scanned back in so they can be compared. So this is what the, uh, the model and how I, I, I took a uh, glenoid and modified it in the CAT software. We then um, 3D printed that in molds and things like that. Um, this is just showing me, you know, again, in my basement, making a lot of these, uh, these models, um, which is it's kind of labor intensive, but once you get the hang of it, you can kind of crank out a lot of this, this uh, bone foam. You can imagine that it'd be difficult to saw bones specifically made for a BT planoid and what that would cost and how, you know, how to actually order that. So learning to make it yourself was sort of a big part of this process. And this is what it looks like when you take your scan model and then overlay it on top of your uh, uh, sort of pre-operative plan, um, looking at it from a sort of a sagittal view so you can compare the, the uh, angular difference. There's some, some papers have done this in a three-dimensional way. Um, I, I think the most surgeons don't think of it in terms of like how many degrees off am I three-dimensionally? They think about inversion and they think about inclination primarily. So it's easier for me to say how close are we in terms of inversion or front to back and how close are we in superior and inferior inclination? And that just makes more sense to me. So I think that would be easier for surgeons to understand. And so this is what we found. 
Um, we found that patient specific instrumentation, this model, was the best. And um, that kind of makes sense in some ways, in that we didn't standardize anything uh, from the position of the, of the lenoid, making it very difficult for other techniques. Um, this one, when you actually lock it into, you know, you're actually touching the lenoid itself, it's going to kind of help guide you a little bit more. So that's one area where I think it was sort of, and there's no soft tissue in this model at all. So um, while it is covered, you can only see the surface of the lenoid, you can really make sure that your, your 3D printed guide sits exactly the way it's supposed to. And that's one of the challenges of the actual guide in real time. But this also looks at um, a lot of, uh, three of my residents are second year residents who are, you had no, no experience with this anatomy at all. And you can imagine that um, their uh, version and inclination are uh, probably not as good because they just have a harder time with the anatomy. So there is significant differences in terms of your version with PSI um, over uh, freehand, although it wasn't actually shown for the mixed reality in that setting. And uh, it was better in terms of superior and inferior inclination. PSI was better than mixed reality and freehand. But if you remove junior residents from it and take myself and the chief resident, you'll notice that it's not super powered to tell the difference, but there is not a significant anymore between PSI and mixed reality. I think that the area where we struggle the most is assessing inclination. So exactly where you want to put your hand. You're, we're very accurate with our version and our start point. That's, that's pretty clear. And PSI is not superior in that way. I think the, the difficult thing is getting, you know, how, how much do you want to drop your hand to the floor? In most cases, um, especially in a reverse cold shoulder, dropping your hand a few extra degrees is not bad at all. It's actually probably favorable for the forces there. So being off by a few degrees there is probably not a big deal, as long as you're always off inferiorly. And only some of the junior residents who were highly accurate, um, but were, were close to zero degrees, some that were actually superior inclined in probably three or four of the models, which is not something you want to have happen in your, in your actual uh, operating room. So this has actually helped modify my practice limit because it really helped confirm that we're very good at assessing version of your guide pin, but um, I will take a, a sort of a crash view. Uh, so I'll, I'll have basically three, three shots in the OR. I'll make sure that at the beginning that we have a good setup of where I want an X-ray to be. When I place my guide pin, I'll use that in comparison to the um, supersonic fossa to kind of tell exactly where my inclination is. It's supersonic fossa almost always about five degrees in your tilted or close to it. You know, that's approximately what we say. So you can use that as sort of, uh, can I match that to my, my pre-op plan, pre-op guide? And so that's kind of helped. Um, improve accuracy. I think just to be aware of technological advancements in general, um, this is before my time, but I felt this would be appropriate for uh, many of the people who were uh, you know, my mentors. Um, <laughs> one of the things we're looking at here is, so let's talk about reverse social. When you think about any new technology, right? Um, there's this whole cycle you can look into about you know, early adopters, late adopters, all that kind of stuff. But one of the things we're finding is that just because you have uh, a different tool, you don't necessarily have to use it. And this is a pretty good paper where they randomized prospective trial looking at uh, treatment of three and four bar fractures in, uh, in elderly patients and finding that there really is no statistically, or at least certainly no clinically significant differences, even though there are some differences in approach statistically significant differences. Like, okay, let's pretend that, for example, that that thing you see with a constant score, uh, pretend that's 0.05 and now it's statistically significant. Well, the minimally clinically significant difference in a constant score is 10 points. So it doesn't really matter if you're different by six points, right? Or the VAS pain score, let's pretend that you drop that uh, P value down. And you know, does it matter if your difference between 0.9 and 1.6 is the VAS pain score? That's like having a systolic blood pressure that's different by you know, five degrees. It doesn't really matter, right? So um, I think that it's affected how we treat patients. So just because you have a new technology doesn't mean you have to apply it. You know, and I'll give an example. This is, uh, I think, probably like two, two weeks in, three weeks in the images from a patient of mine. This is the fracture that's healed in this position. This is a patient who's young enough, like I would consider it surgery, and I sent her for a CAT scan and found lung cancer on the CAT scan. And then uh, that got treated, and fortunately, she is alive. She's probably one of my happiest patients for a couple of reasons. But um, this is her motion. Hard to do better than that with a reverse total shoulder. And uh, you know, it's just, I think it's just a reminder that just because something exists doesn't mean you, you must use it to have the results. So that said, I'm still very optimistic in the future of mixed reality. And one of the reasons is because unlike, you know, reverse total shoulder or other things that really are very invasive and change the way you do things, 
This seems very additive. I mean, it's a lot of value added. It's not high cost. It's one of those things that you don't have to use. It doesn't have to interfere with what you do. You can flip your visor up. It doesn't, it's not just what, it's like one additional source of augmentation for yourself. And one of my colleagues I mentioned before, Dr. Thomas Gregory, it refers to it as like the augmented surgeon or so that the, this tool augments you. It's like having a computer at your fingertips. Now, if you make bad choices before, during, or after surgery, you, you can make bad choices at any time. But having an additional source of information at your fingertips that is sterile, I can't see how it's harmful to patients. It's really one of the things that seems um, rare, but it's additive and doesn't really seem to subtract or get in the way of what you do. Um, so it seems like we can, as you get more experienced hands, you can be very similarly accurate to this station. It seems like it probably will offer a cost savings on a whole because it's a you know, singular $3,500 investment. Um, there are some other downsides to PSI and navigation. They're all still very good. I think that anyone wants to use the technology is still you know, obviously well within their rights to do so. Um, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll kind of see what, what comes of it over time. We're just scratching the surface of what this stuff can do. So um, MR, again, is a, to, this is again one of my residents are looking at something before the surgery. It's not fully immersive, and that's good. You can actually still see the outside world and interact with it. It's highly interactive, so you can manipulate objects in real time. And I think that one of the things that will be hard to break out of the mindset of, but it would be helpful if you can learn this type of, um, learn to use as a tool for many cases. You can use it to plan for lots of different things. So it can be empowering for you in, in many areas, not just one specific style of surgery. So I think it can add value in, in multiple ways that I've talked about. And I'm really excited. I think that this particular device is great for things like, can you use it for surgical training? Yes. Pre-op planning is where I still think it has the strongest value, but intraoperative execution, um, yes. I'm, I'm excited about the navigation options that will come from this. I think that will probably, an iteration of this type of device away from something that can really take up the detail in enough detail to project it without having anything else get in the way or have a long registration period. Um, so uh, thank you for having me. And, uh, um, you know, again, I'm really excited about the future of this device. Uh, happy to share it with you. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. I got, a, I got a question for you. You mentioned a lot of the cost stuff. And one of the things you didn't really calculate in there is the cost of your own time. Um, I understand that that's going to probably ramp up and, you know, you making apps and making it easier will do that. But do you have a comment about the time consuming? Everything? Yes. So very, very good point. There's a couple of things we didn't talk about. So we should talk about downsides, right? Um, let's start with that, right? Uh, obviously the initial input was like a year of time, right? So it's not a small bit of time to learn some of these skills, right? Now that you can know, develop the skill of it, which again, came from some of the 3D printing. It came from a lot of different areas. So you can start to get faster. And, and I'm actually, um, with some of the people I, I mentioned on here, we're, we're developing a website. We're probably gonna be doing some educational aspects of how you do some of this stuff. Um, but I think we can make it easier for people, but certainly it's still somewhat labor intensive. And so I've had some discussions with um, companies who have certain ideas. And I think that for me, if you told me that it's gonna be the average surgeon, you're gonna need a certain amount of time to put to to really plan a case and really think about the case. For me, I think that's about 15 minutes, right? I think if you spend 15 minutes, that's probably the appropriate period of time. More than that, you're gonna start having surgeons who are like, I'm not interested in this technology, right? Certainly more than 30 minutes, you're gonna have a major drop off in what people are interested in doing. For me, to actually make this is probably about 30 minutes, right? Now, it used to be four hours, five hours. You know, it was a lot longer. And I was interested in it from a research standpoint. So it can be dropped down quite a bit, um, I think that once you have more automated softwares doing things for you, the segmentation part of tough cases, you know, taking the diagram images and actually sort of removing the glenoid from the humerus when the bones have no cartilage whatsoever, that is challenging. And there are definitely softwares that can make it easier. Um, but that's one of the hardest parts, and I've gained a lot of speed in doing that. So there is a time commitment to it. I think that most of it is helpful for your patients to actually you know, learn their anatomy and for more difficult cases than what it's fine, but there is value to your time. And I think that uh, currently, uh, this is still relatively labor intensive. Uh, so two other things that I wanted to ask or, or point out. Um, one is, is, you know, there's, first, let me go back. 
the, the, the visualization of doing surgeries, I think is super important, whether you're training or, you know, even if you're been doing it for a long time, especially with a case that's a little bit unique, there's no question that that adds a whole other layer to visualizing what you're trying to achieve. Um, and I think might, you know, open your eyes to a certain, you know, something you might not have necessarily thought of right. before you've got something. You know, for me, when I've got, like, let's just use the Glenway example, you know, that I get that opened up and just a thumb on that, all of a sudden there's all kinds of calculations that yeah. you can't even imagine going on in your head that goes, oh, look at that. There's a little spot right there and you a little double dip or whatever it is. And you're starting to already think, what am I going to do when that reamer goes in there? Right. Um, you know, you already referenced it, but you put a reverse in you're you're trying to get that reamer to get that little smile on the lower part of the glenoid because you get that little tip of that. And those things happen sort of so automatically, it, it becomes difficult to talk about it, it becomes difficult to teach. That's a whole other teaching thing that you can do with that virtual reality thing. And sure. So I, I think there's a lot of value to that part of it, for sure. The last thing I wanted, and I want you to comment on that. The last thing I want you to comment on is, are you getting any information about haptics and feedback? So in mixed reality, no, because there's no way for that to sort of correspond to your hand in that way. Right? That's part of the, the pros and cons of the you know, non-fully immersive stuff. So if you're fully immersed, well, then you're not really using it to care in some way. So it's less of a tool for that. But virtual reality, immersive training does have uh, a lot of development going into haptics. These can be in the form of gloves. It can be actually in the form of some station where you're standing and you're holding different things that provide certain feedback, whether it's like, you know, um, uh, arthroscopy or some type of thing like that. So there's that part is out there, and I think is definitely helpful for training. Um, like you said before, and I, I hope I was, you know, I do think there's a intraoperative execution component that says good, but I, I still think the preoperative planning part is is far and away the highest value to this particular style of uh, of device for now. Um, one other thing I did mention, um, and one reason I've also played around with different colors is that. Lighting and glare can be an issue. So if you're trying to put this on a super bright part of the operating room, where light is very, very bright and on like a uh, certain type of you know, reflection right on the patient or just adjacent to the patient, it can be difficult to see certain colors. So I've you know, been playing around with that a little bit too. So there's some other things where I think um, further iterations and other things will improve on it, but it's not, it, it's not a perfect thing just yet. Um, I think that much like the improvements that I anticipate happening in terms of navigation and visualization, I think that um, the time cost for surgery is going to go down as well. And, um, as you know, that's the, the pros and cons of the financial model um, are there. So while I think it's great that Stryker or other companies are trying to do this, they're going to want you to work with their particular implant. So then planning exactly you know, off something that you only use their software makes it less of a tool for you to use for other cases that you might otherwise want to do. And they won't be set up for that. So that's the downside, but the upside is that if you want to segment something automatically or do things in a quick, quicker turnover time, they're going to invest in that technology heavily because they know that that's what's going to get surgeons to use their implant. So there's some pros and cons to the overall model there, but I think that that's part of the thing we'll find out I think more in the next five years or so. Um, Dr. Um, You could potentially do this with an MRI as well, but you will need some form of imaging Cassian, right? Cassian is the best, in terms of the most accurate way to, uh, to take bony anatomy and turn it into a 3D model. While it's doable with MRI, it's probably not giving you all the detail uh, that you would you otherwise want to get. So I think it, if you're doing a weird tumor case or something else like that. So for example, it's going to be difficult for you to plan certain fractures or other cases, unless you're getting Cassian. So if you have an osteotomy, you're planning or something like that, so that makes sense. Your average distal radius, or you know, it's not, this is not going to work for a lot of different things because you do need that type of uh, imaging in order to make the model uh, then work for you. That's correct. Right. That's what I do. Yeah. There are, there are things like, for example, Blueprint software that is uh, quite popular. Um, a lot of things, if you send it in on a website for many companies, they will then take it and segment it for you um, to make a 3D model. But I, I do that myself, and I found that I can do that pretty quickly now, but that took some time to learn to do it, correct? What I usually do is just say, when they come in to see me, right, um, 
depending on what pathology it is. But uh, for example, I'm, I'm getting a CAT scan on all of my uh, planned shoulder arthroplasty cases. I think that's um, pretty accepted these days, but certainly there's some pretty good evidence to suggest that you can miss big parts of the anatomy and plan if you're not doing that. So I did that first, right? I usually tell patients to plan on the, you know, while they're there in the, in the office at that time when you review the CAT scan, I have not yet made or planned their surgery 100% yet. If they're really particularly interested in seeing it, I'll often show them even ahead of time to show them I'm using this, so this is what I do, but I don't always show them their specific model. I have a colleague who kind of does a bit more of that, but I don't make them come back for that. Yes, I think that that's, uh, I certainly, I think for people um, in, in my age group of training, if I were if I were to poll my colleagues, I would say that uh, ninety nine percent I think people are doing that. Uh, I think that what uh, some of the research has shown is that we miss or uh, underappreciate uh, glenoid deformity with standard X rays. And so, um, look, I think really experienced hands would probably be fine either way, right? I think that they have seen enough to to have good outcomes for patients. But I think that uh, for people at sort of my stage of the game, and therefore, I think if you're gonna, when you come up with plans and what you recommend for people, I think it's best to recommend what the average surgeon should do. You think of yourself as an average surgeon, and then you don't do like weird cowboy stuff that um, you probably can't get away with. So going to every case, thinking myself like, I'm an average surgeon. What can I, what can I do to make this better for my patient rather than like rely on? Skills that you you may or may not have, and you, if you're if you're doing that in general, your pre-op plan will probably uh, benefit more patients than you are. Can you put your headset on so I can see what a special surgeon looks like? <laughs> I, I'm happy to let anyone anyone try it out. Uh, it does look weird. Okay. Uh, when you're doing this in the OR and people can't see what you're touching, mm -hmm. they think you're a crazy person. <laughs> so uh, it is helpful to show uh, on a screen nearby what you're actually uh, you know what you're what you're. There's a way to actually um, get this on the internet. We could, I could show me looking at you on the screen as well. But this is this is what. Yeah, that's why we have Dan in the residence. So yeah, this is what basically what's going to be on in your head. I'm obviously wearing a. I, I wear this sort of like full French sort of you know hood when I when I wear this. You look yeah. fabulous. <laughs> so you're so kind. So somebody get a picture. Um, all right. So. That's awesome. What do you what do you do? I actually looking for uh internet access here, but um, are you health sciences? Are you wireless? Are you wire are, are you health sciences? Are you wireless? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. It's going to record everything. Yeah. Well, yeah. Not sure why we should get right to that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I'm listening to this guy at a podcast, and they rare, occasionally touch on medical topics, but it's coming fast and curious. It's, um, just have like your title slide or something. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. Appreciate this. Is uh, if anyone does, yes. Can you get his eyeballs to glow like that? Don't make him walk into the wall.
Dan, I'm sorry for making a fun of you and wearing a t-shirt in the operating room. But this, is <laughs> this is way better. So they're really into it. Buy this yourself. Yeah. 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 They're super yeah. right? um, Now that I've kind of, if you lay out that model, what it costs differently, for hospitals, isn't to buy a thirty-five hundred dollar thing is nothing. They're, they're probably using that in like their STDs in two patients in a day. I don't know what, it, but it's. <laughs> It's it's a this is nothing for them, right? And the, the bill of over time of patients with instrumentation costs are relatively they're not they're not very high. It's not super expensive to PSI for a case, right? And it can be different on average. Maybe like I said, I've talked a lot to different reps, different places, five hundred bucks to fifteen hundred bucks for a case. But it only takes at max seven cases to equal one of these, right? Um, they like to advertise this. Hospitals and there's a wow factor to it. Patients really like the idea that their surgeons are doing something. That is, it would be very difficult to harm them, especially. They're not, we're not using some like new implant, we're not doing some wacky stuff, but we're showing them an adequate way that Are you arming the bomb? That's which. All right, so we are going to take this. <laughs> it's actually, I have, I have the theme of the Bible inside here, actually, right now. Uh, <laughs> reference to the painting. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm trying to get into my vice world. It's possible that slippery kid will get into Um, yeah, I'm sure actually. So I'll, 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 I'll disconnect this here. Okay. Don't you two guys were not allowed to be in the same room at the same time? Who's that? You and your doppelganger over there. John? Yeah. I mean, put the headset yeah, on you and see you know the difference, right? <laughs> so you're talking about that or not? You know, Dan's, uh, they broke that mold. <laughs> Actually, they miniaturized it and then they broke it. <laughs> Say again? Oh, I think somebody's going to do proof of concept pretty soon. I mean, they've already used the uh, Da Vinci to do a carpal tunnel release from across the room, which, yeah, proof of concept. But I think that's obviously. Yeah, it seems like a carpal tunnel. I can do it from my home. I'd never leave the house. We got a brother that's doing that right now with finances. Doesn't have to go to work anymore. Hope we fix that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
mean, I think, again, the speed up and the acceleration with which they're able to make programs now is going to make a lot of the footwork that he's done obsolete momentarily. Mm -hmm. Like Google Maps, with yeah. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm actually not that surprised. Right? Yeah. It's going to be amazing. That's great. Listen, that's not going to be Reality is, I'm going to have you guys who want to try it on. I think you're going to get into this way that makes a lot of sense. So, unfortunately, I'm probably going to show you you on the screen here. But that's not that important. Next time. Um, I'll bring this uh, I'll bring this to them. Uh, so, if you want to take a look at it. I'm going to wear it while I'm doing it. Next. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, yeah. Sometimes we get CT scans and we ask them to do the 3D trust. I've seen them do it, they just subtract out what they don't want in yeah. a similar process. Yeah. And if we do get those 3D refunds, do you remove that in your software? Would you have to modify it? The 3D refunds, you can't use. At least you can't use them. At least I, I, I try to thought that maybe you could do that. Um, I, I don't think you can use 3D refunds the way that they currently are. There, there might be a way, but as you can imagine, the like, let's say it's not really thinking about the individual surgeons who make that. And so most of the time, that format is not exportable in a way that you can use. So when I did this, bringing, bringing them the safety models to the CAT scanner, um, we set up this protocol, we found a way to do it. But the reality is, it was very tedious. They were burning on an old DVD because that's like that's what their system still had. Do if they? I, I can make a three D model and play around right there. I'm excited that we'd be able to save me a lot of time. But I had to then actually build a new model. Because unfortunately, there just wasn't uh, a way to take that format. With newer models, it's not impossible. It should. I mean, you think it should be doable, but it's probably not doable. Uh, more likely, you'll find a uh, portal of some kind where you ask the radiology, say, like, "I need the diacom images for this," and then they will get you them and you download them on the computer. Um, and then from there, you can put them in any software like 3D Slicer or Invisalius. So there's a number of ones out there that some of them are very simple and they simply use like um, the, it's like playing the contrast, right? You can basically you know, play with it and it will pick up something and then build on that. The more complicated ones though, that's where it gets hard. As your bones are touching arthritis really bad, it can't say anything out for you. You have to do something like, but one of the models called, or one of the ways it was called growth and seeds where you kind of draw out these different areas. You define them yourselves and then you add an algorithm to that, which will then like pick up what is what is low and what is humorous, and you can make some kind of touch. So that's what the most like thing they have. Once you have the rest of the setup, it's not that that part of it, um, which I've gotten better and better at, is probably the most labor intensive part of the process. Um, and there are some uh, really good YouTube uh, uh, videos of how to do that. There's even a, a guy um, who his his name yeah, I'll, I'll butcher his name, so it's a relatively long read name. He's uh, back to Wake Forest. He's got a lot of stuff online about this. Teach people to uh, once a blender. There's an add on, he has a blender software that can do that. So, I mean, he even used to be like, I've made those implants myself. I'm planning these cases for, uh, I made the, the, the glenosphere and the base plate and did all that in the CAD software, which I had no experience doing before. It's not, I mean, it's not easy, but it's not that hard. You can, free time is not high on your, your list right now. I'm not aware, but certainly uh, this is an investment in your future that will, will benefit you. I mean, I think you do. Well, to learn how to do this in whatever whatever kind of area you're going into. Yes. Where's the progress at? Or is it super like trajectory and stuff like that? Yeah. So I think that's the that's the navigation point I was kind of hinting at before, and I think there's a lot of that happening right now. There's major bets being put on it, different companies specifically. I think that uh, we're still at least one iteration away, in my opinion, for this because like, I can do it with. Commercially available stuff called the Euphoria software, where you can you can program a model into that. It's called model targeting. There's two. There's basically two image targeting and model targeting. Image targeting is like when you take a QR code and you look at it. You're on your phone. You could bring up you know a website, or you can bring up a three dimensional image of a Viking jumping over a river. It doesn't really matter what it is, right? So and you can walk around and gain some information from that three D three D image. That's very simple. Any anything can pick up a, a specific enough image. The problem is 
model targeting is much harder. So you have to sort of train a database to do that. And if your model involves the entire scapula, in real life, you don't look at the entire scapula. I can peel every muscle off of the patient, they would not appreciate that, right? So that would just be very helpful. So you need to be able to plan out a super small area of the glenoid. And we're, we're not there yet, right? At least not just by looking at it. We're definitely there in terms of registering that and other forms of navigation where you can take a, a probe of some kind, usually there's an infrared device or something like that. And you're, you're basically teaching whatever is looking, whatever camera is looking at it, where your patient's anatomy is. And there's a couple of ways of some companies like RFID tags and other, other things to register the human anatomy is in front of you. But in terms of just looking at it and registering it, like with just the software available in the mixed reality technology device, not there yet. I bet it's several years away before it's accurate. So painting out like the scapular spine and the superior quarter and the inferior. That is, it's doable now. Meaning that there's one and study combining that with what you're seeing in the glenoid, like the actual. Right. The only studies that have been done <clears throat> have used the HoloLens one, and they were able to do it. But that navigation process, much to expect in any navigation process, that's the hardest part, right? So they did it on a three three D printed model that didn't have anything in the way. Will that work on a real patient? That is yet to be seen. There are um, other things that are out there that are, you know, sort of in development that I think are easier than what's currently happening. So um, the implant that I like to use, I know they're working on some stuff. It's pretty interesting, but the reality is that there's still some. The navigation component will always be the registration component of navigation. Seems like it will always be the hardest part. I do think we'll get there to the point where you just look at it and it's gonna, it's gonna, you know, pick okay. up that that detail. Yeah. But that part's not there yet. So it's still that's a little science fiction. fiction. It's not, not very far away, but I don't know exactly when you're going to find that patients. And you can imagine just because trying to tell the difference of a very small thing when there's shiny, you know, a lot of fluids and blood and other stuff around it, and it can be difficult to figure out the difference. Is there an option to have your trainee for a second head test so they can see what you're seeing as well? So I have an opportunity. So um, not with like obviously, yes, uh, I've seen there are types of software where you can collaborate like that and share the same model. Um, I have not seen that with trainees yet. And if anyone's going to do that, it's going to be, I think, more commercially, commercial development stuff where like guys who work for Stripe are going to use the fellows and, and eventually they're going to get something to, to do that work because they have a dedicated software engineer who can play around with that. Like, I, I, I don't do that. <laughs> but um, it's, it's not far away. It's certainly, I think, within, in, within the capacity of the technology. Sands. Uh, that. Uh, it's fascinating. I'm going to go home and dig out my pocket protector and dive in head <laughs> on this because it's, uh, it's really interesting. From a standpoint of arthroscopy, are there any applications of like taking those holographic like, live time images and, and working on, like, for instance, like hip arthroscopy, like the highest risk issue is drilling into the acetabulum and put it in an angle. But if you had a malleable holographic image, you could. Kind of check yourself. Is that feasible at this time or is that the next I think iteration? The hardest part of that, because arthroscopy is so it's 2D um, working on 3D, right? right? What, what you would need, you'd need a Cassian, right? Or an MRI, yeah, which, we have. which you have the MRI. So you can segment pretty accurately from that. Registering it to your patient accurately is hard. And then using that to then tell where your where your actual uh, nerve is. You still don't necessarily know. Maybe you can you can be made more accurate. You could segment that. I'll say more like an angulation of drilling. Like for that, so, you know. okay. so if you want to know exactly what drill, you have to have an RFID tag or something specific about cool drill that kind of gives you the information about like a 3D projection. So you have to overlay that over where you are. That's not really science fiction. You like that's that's a doable thing. Um, and it's because you know, we do a navigation already, right? We, as long as we can navigate where things are. Uh, for example, the uh, uh, exact tech has a you know, pretty nice um, GPS system that will really tell you what it is deep or you know. But again, it's about correctly registering the app. And when you don't actually cut into the patient, making sure that you've actually appropriately registered the anatomy, unless you're, you're using landmarks on the surface of the body, that'd be hard to do. It's not, it's not impossible. We know there are 3D scanners that are handheld now where you can scan a person's body. You can Mouth, all kinds of things you use in dentistry um, that can generate a 3D model quickly. But generating that model and then overlaying your patient anatomy onto it 
in a rapid time frame or high accuracy is still science fiction. That's not, it's not impossible, but we just, I have not seen anybody doing that yet, right? Um, could you conceivably uh, do that or know how deep you are, that kind of thing? Like drilling? Yeah, you, you could do that. Um, I think that it will be interesting. I think that's one area where our processing would benefit from that and sort of having a deeper understanding of where you are in the bony anatomy, especially on the hip, right? It's a little bit tough for me to figure out exactly how that would happen on the fly, but I think it's not impossible. And I've seen it used for other things, like not, you don't need it for this in shoulder arthroscopy, but again, like having a three-dimensional model of the tear, or even like guys who use ultrasound in their office, not having to look away and they can look at the patient and like have it brought up on their screen so they can do things live while they're doing it. Like that's, you know, necessary, no. I mean, obviously people are doing fine about it, but it, I think it's just sort of pushing the envelope of what you can do. So at one point you can kind of conceivably have it uh, involved in, in other areas of uh, arthroscopy. All right, I'm gonna wrap this part up then and uh, we'll get ready to go.